Risk is the chance of something happening that will impact on us achieving our objectives. There are all sorts of risks facing our projects, including schedule risk, which is the risk of delivering a project later than expected, and cost risk, which is the risk of going over budget. Systems engineering certainly assists in the management of an array of these sorts of risks, but it's technical risk that's the primary focus of systems engineering. Technical risk could include delivering a system that is not up to the required standard in terms of function and performance, or is not able to be maintained in accordance with the support concept, or is not sufficiently reliable to carry out its intended purpose, or is too expensive or difficult to produce in the required quantities. To understand individual risks and to compare different risks to one another, we need to look at all of them to appreciate their individual likelihood and their individual impact. At one end of the spectrum, we might be facing risks that are extremely likely to occur and will have dire consequences on our objectives if they do occur. At the other end of the spectrum, we might be facing risks that are very unlikely and will only have a very small impact on our objectives. The former are called extreme risks and the latter are called insignificant risks. Naturally, in between those extremes will be risks with different combinations of likelihood and consequence resulting in an array of risk severity assessments. Systems engineering is a discipline that continually assists with risk management. For example, we conduct progressive design reviews as we pass through the design phase to try and detect and correct errors as early as possible. We conduct rolling evaluation programs and audits as the system passes through design and development and into construction and production to ensure that we've come up with a properly documented design that actually works. And we're always considering design alternatives and choosing the most balanced design approach to our problems. These are all examples of how systems engineering contributes to technical risk management. Sometimes we are confronted with risks that are so severe that they need action. Classic responses to severe technical risks are to avoid the risk by taking an alternative design approach or to reduce the risk by reducing either its likelihood or its impact or by transferring the risk onto another party who is better placed to manage the risk. Let's say the land upon which we're building our house is a sloped block. There might be a risk of subsidence on the block that's deemed just too high to accept. To avoid this risk, we could include a retaining wall in our design concept, or we could use excavation to level the block. It should be noted that by avoiding one risk, in this case subsidence, we are invariably exposing ourselves to other risks. For example, if we took the excavation option, the excavation allows us to avoid the subsidence risk, but the process might be very expensive and time-consuming and difficult to predict, thereby exposing us to cost and schedule risk. Let's look at an example of reducing rather than avoiding risk. Our house design concept might include a spiral staircase. Although that's compact and pleasing to the eye, the probability of someone falling down the spiral staircase might be deemed to be just too high by the house owners, and a more traditional staircase is requested instead. There's still a risk that someone might fall down the more traditional staircase, but the probability will be much reduced, and the revised risk severity might now be acceptable. Other examples of risk management within our house design might be to build spare capacity into the house for future growth. For example, we might reduce the risk of overloading our electrical system by ensuring that each circuit is only carrying 50% of its design capacity. This reduces the risk of overloading our circuits and provides a platform for future growth. Another design approach that we may take is to build redundancy into our designs, especially for safety or mission critical elements of the design. For example, we might consider our watering system in our garden to be critical. If our watering system fails, we risk losing very expensive plants, lawns and gardens. Of course, we might be relying on the garden for our food as well. In this case, we might decide to design a watering system that uses the house power under normal conditions, but is also backed up by a battery in the case of an electrical failure. Another risk mitigator is to use design diversity in our system. Design diversity is where we use different design approaches in the design of our redundant systems so that something that causes one approach to fail 
will not necessarily cause the other approach to fail. Let's look at another example of using the concept of design redundancy and diversity to reduce technical risk. Let's say we're working on an aircraft system and there's a computer system on board that aircraft that simply must not lose electrical power. It might be a flight control computer, for example. Engineers will be tasked to design an electrical system to provide electrical power to that flight control computer. Initially, their design might involve driving a generator from one of the engines to provide the necessary electrical power. Upon review, this design may be viewed as an unacceptable risk because the probability of generator failure may simply be too high and the subsequent impact on flight safety may be just too dire to accept. In short, a failed generator equals no electrical power. No electrical power equals no flight control computer. No flight control computer equals a plane crash. So the engineers revised their design and used the concept of redundancy by adding a second generator to run off the other engine as a backup. If the main generator fails, the backup generator can take over. Another review of that design reveals that there are still circumstances that could cause both generators to fail. This circumstance is often called a common mode of failure. Engineers may solve this by using the concept of design diversity, and in this case they might simply add a battery. The battery performs the same function as the generators, i.e. it provides electrical power, but it does that in a different way by using chemical rather than mechanical means. By using design techniques like redundancy and diversity, the engineers have addressed the technical risk, in this case the risk of losing electrical power to a critical computer. Note that they have not reduced the impact of the risk in this case. If the computer loses power, the aircraft will still crash, but they have reduced the probability of the computer losing power. Because risk severity is a function of both probability and impact, they have reduced the risk severity by reducing the probability of it occurring. Spare capacity, redundancy and design diversity have been incorporated in the design of many technical systems that are all around us today in order to mitigate technical risk. Examples include cars, transportation systems, aircraft, medical facilities and so on. Sometimes though we consider the risks that we're facing and decide to take on the risks because of the potential benefits that may accrue as a result of taking the risk. For example, making use of leading edge technology in our design can be risky due to all the unknowns. However, there may be major advantages in terms of function and performance associated with using that leading edge technology. In other words, sometimes the old risk equals return adage is well worth considering. Throughout this course, we've discussed the idea of periodically reviewing our work at logical points in the design and development process. This is an effective way of detecting errors, conflicts and problems with our design as early as possible. After all, we know that the earlier we detect issues, the easier and cheaper they are to rectify. In this course, we're suggesting reviewing things after major transitions. For example, we spoke of a system level review called the system design review when we transition from stakeholder to system level requirements. We suggested a subsystem level review called the preliminary design review and we also suggested a detailed design review called the critical design review when the designers believed that they'd completed the detailed design of the system. The names of these reviews are not important. It's the concept of periodic and progressive review that we're trying to talk about here. Conducting reviews of this nature just makes sense and they're not mysterious systems engineering activities. They are simply technical meetings that are conducted in a controlled and a professional manner, involving appropriate groups of people that aim to review work packages, approve plans for the next stages, and resolve any problems that are facing the development effort. When I say that the meetings are conducted in a controlled and professional manner, I'm just referring to standard meeting protocol, such as making sure that we've got an agenda for each review which outlines what's going to be covered, how long it's going to take, and who is leading the presentations. Ensuring that minutes are taken and agreed upon prior to the conclusion of the meeting, and an agreed chairperson to maintain control over the meeting. These technical reviews must be held at an appropriate time within the development program. 
If they're held too early, the development effort will not be sufficiently advanced for the review to be meaningful. If they're held too late, we might miss opportunities to rectify issues or problems in a timely fashion. My overwhelming experience here is that reviews tend to be held too early rather than too late. My experience is that some people like to be seen to be progressing on schedule even if the technical program is lagging. The attitude seems to be that the technical program will just have to catch up after the review. Artificially conducting reviews against the project schedule can give the impression that the project is on schedule. Conducting technical reviews too early in order to artificially adhere to a project schedule is not recommended. Instead, we should fix problems with the technical program as early as possible in the systems engineering process. There's a great expression that applies here, that bad news is not like red wine. Bad news does not get better with age. It's always best to recognise problems as early as possible rather than pushing them later, where they'll invariably become much worse. Systems engineering planning must take account of the technical program and plan for these design reviews. Design reviews will take time, cost money and will involve a number of different people. That's why planning for them is important. The number and nature of technical reviews will be different for every single project. So we must think about every project as a unique undertaking when considering how to conduct these reviews. A risky project using developmental technology and involving large sums of money will be reviewed more thoroughly than a project at the other end of the spectrum. A fundamental systems engineering management task is to determine the most appropriate technical strategy to use on our system development. In this course, we've used a classic process known sometimes as the waterfall approach. We chose this approach for this course for a bunch of reasons. Firstly, it remains a popular approach to systems engineering. Secondly, it's logical and sequential, making it ideal for explaining the whole systems engineering process. And thirdly, even if it's not used as the development approach, it still represents the basic building blocks of other popular approaches. To recap how we explain systems engineering in this course, using the house as an example, you will recall that we assumed that we were going to do the whole house project in one single pass. That is, we were going to go from a complete conceptual design to a complete physical design in one pass. In doing this, Firstly, the system was understood via requirements engineering. Then, all of the system elements were identified and understood. Then, all of the elements that needed designing were designed, integrated and tested. Then, all of the elements were integrated to form the system and it was tested. And then, finally, the whole system went through the production and construction process. This strategy does work in some circumstances. For example... When we have enough time and money to do the whole lot at once, when we understand our requirements at the system level well enough to base the whole effort on those requirements, when our requirements are sufficiently stable that they don't keep changing, forcing expensive and time-consuming rework, and when technology and expertise is sufficiently available and stable to be able to solve the whole problem at once. Note that to be successful, pretty much all of these things need to be in place. If one or two of these things are missing, then the waterfall approach may not be the best approach for you. There are alternatives. Let's say we understood all of our requirements for our house and we had the technology and expertise in place to design and build it, but we didn't have enough time or money to do the whole project at once. How could we proceed? Well, common sense would tell us that we would design the whole house so that the design accounts for everything that we want but then we'd implement the design in a series of interconnected stages or phases. In between the stages or phases, we would be living in the house, saving up money, and then proceeding with the next phase. Because we'd taken the subsequent phases into account right from the very start, phase two would be able to build on phase one, phase three would be able to build on phase two, and so on. In systems engineering, we might label this an incremental approach. What if we didn't really understand all of our requirements in a lot of detail right at the start? We might be certain about some of our requirements, but not certain about others. We might build the house based on the requirements we understood and then build plenty of spare capacity into the design 
so that we can address our future needs when those future needs become more apparent. As we live in the house, we develop our requirements for additional capability. When we have enough time and money, and when we understand our requirements a little better, we then embark on an evolution of the original house. This might be in the form of an extension or a reconfiguration. Naturally, in this case, we will be constrained by whatever form the house currently takes. Because we didn't have a thorough picture in mind when we started, like we did with the incremental or waterfall approach, we might need to evolve in a suboptimal manner. We might, for example, find ourselves saying, if only I'd realised that I wanted to do such and such when I was building the original house, I would have dot dot dot. You can fill in the blanks with things like, if only I'd known that I wanted a pool, I would have located the stormwater drain in a different place. Or, if only I'd known that I wanted to convert my carport into a garage, I would have laid a much stronger concrete slab, and so on. The bottom line is that there are many ways to execute systems engineering. We've discussed the waterfall approach in this MOOC, and we've also touched on alternatives like the incremental and evolutionary approach. When people say that systems engineering has not worked on their project, they are probably saying that an inappropriate systems engineering approach was employed on their project. Systems engineering is not a one-size-fits-all process. What works in one situation probably won't work so well in other situations. There is no such thing as a perfect systems engineering process. Systems engineering must be tailored to suit each unique situation. All of the preceding discussions should highlight the critical importance of planning the overall systems engineering effort. For example, in the preceding discussions, we've explained that we really do need to plan. We need to answer questions like, what strategy are we using? Who's doing what? When are the reviews happening? What design development and production resources are required? What are some of the big risks that we're facing? And finally, what is our approach to key systems engineering issues like evaluation, configuration management and requirements engineering? In developing an idea of the answer to all of these key questions, we will be going through a planning process. When we've agreed on the answers and written those answers down, we will have a plan. In systems engineering, this plan is generally called the Systems Engineering Management Plan, or simply the SEMP. The critical thing to remember is that the plan is only an artefact. It's the planning effort that is the most vital component of producing the plan. I'm sometimes asked to help organisations produce a SEMP. Sometimes the organisation is focused on producing an artefact that complies with some formatting and content requirement. Really, they're missing the point. What they really need to do is to go through the planning process and discuss how they are going to tackle all of the elements of the systems engineering process and then write the plan. I can't stress enough that the planning process results in the plan, not the other way around. Another point to make is that the plan, or the SEMP, will not remain static over a typical project, so systems engineers must continue to plan and must continue to update their strategies in order to meet the challenges of a changing situation. This is simply a fact of life on a typical project. Systems engineering rarely, if ever, exists in its own right, independent from other professional disciplines. Bringing a solution to a complex problem into existence will involve a lot of different disciplines working together. Systems engineers are closely related to the discipline of project management. In some cases, project managers will need input from systems engineers to organise things like scope, cost and schedule estimates. In some cases, systems engineers will need assistance from project managers in order to do their job. There is a very strong correlation between the systems engineering effort and the project management effort. Systems engineering is a life cycle discipline. At various points in this course, we've discussed life cycle concepts that require us to think about maintenance and support, facilities, training, personnel, disposal, and so on. A critical technical discipline known as Integrated Logistic Support, or ILS, is focused on influencing the design and development effort of our system with through life support in mind. To that end, there is a very strong relationship between systems engineering and ILS. Both disciplines need to work closely together in order to achieve a system 
that both meets customer requirements but is also supportable throughout its life. The key to success with this is to ensure that the systems engineering and ILS professionals start working together on these issues as early in the process as possible. What we're really saying is that this thinking, involvement and cooperation needs to happen right from the time we start talking about business and stakeholder needs. On technical projects, the systems engineering effort will be responsible for managing, directing, controlling and supporting an array of classic technical disciplines. The nature of these disciplines will vary depending on the nature of the project and the system. For example, on our house, we'll be dealing with technical disciplines such as carpenters, joiners, plumbers, electricians, bricklayers and so on. On more complex systems like modern aircraft, we will be dealing with aerospace engineers, jet engine specialists, material specialists, electronic engineers, software engineers and so on. Naturally, ensuring that all of these disciplines are working closely and cooperatively together will be a major determinant of success. This is a major role of the systems engineering management.